Okay, I think we're good to begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this event. Uh, hopefully, you can all hear and see me. Uh, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat as well. If you'd like to ask a question, we've got a Q&A box, so you can jump in there and ask some questions there. Um, but we're going to be keeping an eye on everything. So I'm trying to stay across all of it. I love that my WhatsApp is currently blowing up with people I didn't even realize were going to be in this call on this call. So hello, everybody. <laughs> It is great that such a vast number of people have joined from all over the world. This is incredible. Okay, so let's kick off. Today's event is the latest product of a collaboration between LBTQ Women and Fora Space. First up, a little bit of information. Fora was founded in 2014 by Katrina Larkin and Enrico Sanna to create flexible, hospitality-focused workspaces for large and small organizations. And they now have 11 premises in London and Reading. Katrina and Enrico say they understand the importance of diversity and the LGBT community. They're determined to demonstrate that the right working environment means not leaving anyone out. So thank you for a space for hosting this. LBTQ Women is a growing network for women within the wider community. Pippa Dale, one of its founders, recognized that the female side of the LGBT community was and can still be overlooked. LBTQ Women is trying to change that through events just like this and collaborations with forward-thinking companies like Fora. So, as the BBC's first LGBT correspondent and as one of very few Black, young and gay journalists, I'm proud to be moderating this very important discussion today. So thank you all for having me and joining me. Um, so just so you know, this is being recorded, which is why I'm going to stick to a script for the most part so I don't lose my job by the time this ends. Um, but why don't we kick off with some introductions for our awesome panelists. Uh, I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves and say who you are and what you do. And um, why don't we kick off with Ali? Uh, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ali Camps. I'm the co-chair of Pride in London. been with uh, Pride in London since we took over organising the event in 2013 uh, starting as the marketing director that's my gay job and in my day job i am the deputy chairman of um, uh, market research consultancy called quadrangle awesome um jan hello good morning and good afternoon everybody uh, i'm delighted to be here today like ali my professional um uh, background is a market is in marketing that's been my career but I'm a trustee of an organisation in the UK called Stonewall. I was the chair until uh, a couple of weeks ago. Don't worry, I haven't been sacked. It was all organised as I would stand down at this moment. But I'm continuing on the board while I support the arrival of our new chair. And Stonewall is an organisation that celebrated its 30th birthday last year. We were founded on the back of some particularly insulting legislation brought in 30 years ago called Section 28, where just the mere mention of, of uh, gay people was to be banned in schools. That was the beginning of our work and we've been campaigning along with allies such as on this programme today ever since to change legislation and attitudes in society so that people can be accepted without exception. Awesome stuff. Phil. Hi everyone and yeah it's a pleasure to be here on this um, panel and this discussion. Um, I'm Phil also known as Lady Phil or Philip Okujima and in my I like the gay job and day job. So in my day job, I am the executive director of Kaleidoscope Trust, which is a leading LGBT plus human rights international charity, which upholds human rights for LGBT plus people. Um, and in my gay job and other activities outside, I'm the co-founder and executive director of UK Black Pride, which was set up primarily to look at how we center black and brown people of color in the UK um, who happen to be queer LGBT plus um, because I would like to say that we didn't necessarily see ourselves in wider representation of all aspects of LGBT activities. Sounds good. David, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on this panel with such incredible community leaders. Uh, I am David Correa. I'm the interim executive director for New York City Pride. 
I've been with the organization since 2016 and um, stepped into this role uh, late last year, uh, about November. Um, so it has been quite a ride over the years, but a dream job nonetheless. I'm excited to do the work um, and excited to talk about what we are discussing today. Awesome stuff. So just to say for anyone watching, there is a Q&A box, so you can type your questions in there. And there's also a chat box as well. I love that someone just shouted out Peckham. Hello. Um, so yes, feel free to send through any questions at all and we will get through them in this discussion. So on to the discussion. And um, before we want to go any further, I would like to point out that LBTQ women believe that during the month of June, somewhere in the region of 250 pride parades in the UK and the USA are being affected by the COVID-19 crisis. So any gatherings and marches are not going to be the usual in your face, super vibrant, visual celebrations of the LGBT community that we're so used to every single year. So the purpose of this event today is to kind of invite our panelists to offer up ideas on how to ensure that LGBT people remain heard, remain visible, and remain powerful in 2020. And um, the organizers want to try and understand what the community is potentially losing this summer and together see what else is out there to get the community through this. So into the discussion. Um, for some people, pride is a protest. For others, it's a party or a statement or just a, sta a space for people to be themselves. Pride carries a great deal of meaning for every single person within the LGBT community. So what does it mean for our panelists? Panelists, what are your memories of your first Pride event? And what does Pride mean to you? I'm gonna to come to Ali first because she's just alongside my face there. Uh, right, so my, um, I actually came out quite late in life. I didn't come out until I was um, 37, even though I had known for a long, long time um, that I was gay. Um, my first Pride memory was actually going down to, uh, I was driving down to Brighton Pride with my best friend from school who had come out herself a few years before. Um, and we hadn't seen particularly eye to eye over that. So we were driving down and at the time I had this um, little vintage um, Sunbeam Alpine that was always breaking down, it was red and kind of had a soft top and it was fabulously cool but not very functional. Um, and it broke down halfway to uh, Brighton sure enough. Anyway, so that was the moment I, told, I chose to tell her um, that um, I was gay too and we so between where we were living in Brighton it was probably about I don't know 50 or 60 miles we were halfway there uh, I swear to god she spent the rest of the journey and indeed the rest of the day just laughing she didn't talk to me she just laughed at me for the whole um, of the day so pride for me um, is very symbolic um, of uh, not just coming out but um, of I suppose be getting into a position where I could be true to myself and um, uh, and also never forgetting the years where I wasn't true to myself and the, the pain that that um, caused me and other people ultimately. You're on mute then. I'm on mute. It had to happen to me, didn't it? It had to happen <laughs> at some point. Goodness. No one make an internet meme out of me, please. Gosh. Um, over to Lady Phil. What does Pride mean to you? What was your first Pride event? Oh, so my first Pride event was 17 years ago and it was in London, but, and it was, it was great. It was wonderful. It was one where I think I got lost in the, the maze of how many people are out there. And it was also part of my own coming out journey and experience. But I think when I talk about what does Pride mean to me, I think my very first Pride was the one which I attended, which was UK Black Pride, which was 15 years ago in South End when we took a group of um, black and brown people to a space which, didn't feel like we could historically own. Um, and we were there, I think it's more about the, the food, feeding our bellies and laughing and joking, the volleyball that was being played, the dominoes, the music, and people doing some very wonderful things with their bodies as they danced. And some of the really, really cute women I'm not putting a plug out there to say that I'm single or anything, but you know, can't see everyone's face, but I would say that we had, I think what was an inspiring, motivating, it was about shared commonalities. It felt like you were not alone 
that we could talk and celebrate and remember those that are with us and remember those that we had lost. Um, and also just understanding what our blackness and our brownness and our people of color and everything about what makes us who we are meant to each and every single one of us. Um, it was a it was a party, but it was also us protesting and saying that we are here and we deserve to be seen. We were seen and we felt each other. Not like that, some may have. <laughs> or but, not only that you know, way. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually felt each other and connected on such a deep level because there had never been a Black Pride in the UK that allowed us to center who we are. And it came at a, at a price because there was so much resistance to the Black Pride being created that it made it all the more powerful when we came together in our numbers and showed unity and solidarity with each other. Awesome, love, love that. Um, over to, let's go to Jan next. What does Pride mean to you and what was your first Pride event? Well, I had an incredibly privileged first Pride. I had, I had joined the board of Stonewall and uh, I w it was only uh, seven years ago. I was married for 16 years to, uh, to a chap and fell in love with a woman in my, in my um, late 40s. So I was very new to, to the whole Pride scene. And fortunately for me, Stonewall had a tradition of taking about 200 young people, teenagers, 16, 17, 18 year olds from all across the country and basically looking after them as they attended their very often first Pride themselves. And we gathered beforehand at um, Westminster University in Marylebone and Sir Ian McKellen, who was one of the founders of of uh, Stonewall, which is why I was excited to see him. Of course, they were excited because he's Gandalf in uh, Lord of the Rings. He came that year to speak to these young people. And so for me, it was an astonishing history lesson where he described early prides uh, all those decades before. And he, and, he just, and he told us to enjoy and savor the march because when he had first gone on prides, they were spat at. They only were allowed to walk through Soho. There was a lot of antagonism and violence and hatred. And it was extraordinary to be reminded of the roots of pride, of course, which go right back to the Stonewall riots after which we are named. And in this joyful group of young people, incredibly excited, I think, because I don't think they would have ever been with so many young gay people. I mean, Phil is advertising herself here. I can imagine those young people were very, very excited to be all meeting each other. But as we marched and as I soaked up this incredible atmosphere of joy and love and celebration and colour, just in advance of our enormous party was a very small group of maybe three or four people and they had homemade placards on bits of cardboard. And I remember reading one of them and it said, we're so happy to be here because we can't do this in Istanbul. And, and for me, it was so poignant having listened to Sir Ian talk about early prides in London and then to see this tiny little group with their proud placard in front of us. It was extremely sobering and I was very, very moved by it. And I think for me, it brought home how fortunate we were and, and Ali does so much to keep the show on the road with her uh, team. Uh, I went the next day to, to UK Black Pride, which was another wonderful, joyful experience again. Uh, but, but actually the politics of it for me were made very clear right from the beginning. And I think it's extremely important that we never ever forget that. The symbolism of, the symbolism of those of us who are fortunate enough to take to our streets, we are there, for all those who can't be. And we mustn't ever forget about that. Thank you, Jan. And over to David. What are your memories of your first Pride and what does Pride mean to you? 
Well, Pride means so much to me. Uh, my first Pride was in the year 2000. It was New York City Pride. Uh, I was just recently out. I mean, maybe just as a select number of people, just a few friends. And my best friend said, well, let's do baptism by fire and let's go to New York City Pride. So uh, we not necessarily snuck out. Her mother took us. We told my mother we were going on a church retreat. And I went in the car in my church garb and then got on the train and changed into shorts and a tank top and put glitter all over myself. And it was scary and I was nervous and I felt like I was not in my own skin, but I was also really, really excited to start expressing this part of me that I had hidden for so long. And I had no idea what to expect. And I get to New York, we pull into Grand Central Station and there are thousands of LGBTQ people everywhere. I had never seen anything like it. I, I didn't, we didn't have that representation in television. I didn't see that in it, where I lived and I lived in a very diverse city. Um, and I, I was, I was shocked and excited and confused. And we, I just remember standing there in awe of the millions of people on the sidewalks, these beautiful people of all different colors and races and creeds and just covered in joy and being out, just filling Fifth Avenue in a way that I had never seen before. Um, and at the time, I think it was just so overwhelming for me that I didn't realize the impact of pride. Um, it wasn't until years later where I have never missed a pride since the year 2000. This would have been my 20th. Um, that my husband and I, when we were younger, would attend pride. And we always knew that that was the one time of year that we could hold hands in public and not be afraid, even in New York City. It was the one time of year where we could do that, that small gesture, that small, what many people take for granted. And people like, this is, this is us and we're so proud to do it. And it only lasted for a week. And then it went away and we were used to it and we were fine with that. So for me, what I realized over the years is what, what pride is to people is a safe space. It's a place where folks young folks, I think back to my younger self, really do get to discover themselves, be themselves, express themselves, and, and, and live out loud. And I, I'm, I'm excited that we get to, be, us, these panelists, and everyone that's on the chat, and all the people that we work with, our volunteers, our members, um, that we get to do this work, because it means so much to so many people. That was such an awesome answer, but you've made me feel really sad about the fact it's not happening this year now. That's, yeah, it's just, it really hit me then. That moment of freedom, that moment of feeling so accepted where you can just walk down the street and just see everyone so happy for you to be yourself. The reality that that isn't going to happen or may not happen in a way we're so traditionally used to is quite a scary thought. So on to the next question. Um, I'm going to come back to you, David, first. We'll go backwards for this one. Um, what would your events have looked like this summer? For me, I had good plans this summer. I was ready to go to all these different Pride events. I was ready to go international. We were supposed to be taking like different flights around and going to small Prides and big Prides and documenting people's experiences at them and seeing what the differences are and really highlighting what it means to be proud. But all of that at the moment is very much up in the air. I'm not really sure what's going on with it. So for your events, um, David, for instance, your World Pride last year was ridiculously big. It was one of the best times of my life. And being around such warmth and such wonderful people and seeing Lady Phil's Grand Marshal going by in a car, zipping by, it was just everything. What was this June going to be like for you? Well, last year was incredible. It was literally a dream come true. I, I didn't even know it was a dream that I had until I experienced it. Uh, I will definitely always look back at that time with so much pride. Um, I'm proud of what we did as a community. Um, I'm proud of the number of people that showed up. We had 5 million people in New York City celebrating World Pride. I'm so happy to have found a friend in Lady Phil. We spent a lot of time together last year. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Um, 
we were not expecting 5 million people, uh, but in a normal year for New York City, we see about two and a half million. Um, so we were anticipating that. Uh, we got a lot of attention last year, so we did not foresee that our, our pride was going to shrink. Um, we were expecting to see those numbers and on a smaller scale, something that I think, though a smaller number resonates even more, we created an event called Youth Pride three years ago that saw about 1,500 kids in a small park, completely free, 100% free for these kids. There's not anything that they pay. There's, there is literally open the doors and come on in. And um, last year we saw 10,000 LGBTQ plus teens, allies, families in Central Park celebrating openly. And we were ready to do it again. Um, so that's part of what we're gonna be missing this year. Um, and we're heartbroken about it, but we're coming up with other ways that we can still speak to the community. And we will cover some of those plans in just a moment. I actually covered Youth Pride last year for BBC Breakfast. And the best thing for me about the event was seeing people there with their parents. It was so nice seeing like parents covered in rainbows and glitter supporting their young people. Um, it's something that, yeah, just a few years ago, even when I was growing up, I couldn't really foresee that even being a thing. You never really saw that on TV or in movies. It was always the bad side. Um, so yeah, word on to you guys for that. Phil, how many people would you have been hoping to reach this year and what would your events have looked like? So last year, we got to a staggering number of 10,000 people, um, which was just absolutely amazing for us to see. And, you know, like David said, I think the youth engagement, seeing young queer people of colour coming out in their thousands, you know, to celebrate who they are without apology, you know, expressing themselves in so many, so many different ways. I think, what would we be doing this year? Oh, we had so much planned, but we still have so much planned. Um, I think in a space where people connect physically, there's a, there's a sort of healing that comes with it because connection and physical touch is a beautiful thing if one wishes to be um, you know, touched in that way. But we're looking at more digital and virtual, our virtual plans to connect with people because we understand that so many people being isolated on this lockdown means that we have to find new innovative and creative ways to connect with them. You know, there are people who are on lockdown with families that they don't wish to be, but there is nowhere else for them to go. There are young people who are currently still sofa surfing and that's a form of homelessness um, in places which feels, you know, so isolating and soul destroying for them. So this year, we have teamed up with a number of different organizations. We're connecting with Black Prides around the world so that will include Black Prides in the States, in Paris, in Amsterdam. Um, Amsterdam's a, an organization that they've got out there. We're hoping to, and I know that Be Glad and um, Donya, who's from Barbados, she's online right now. So we're hoping to connect with Barbados as well, because for us, this isn't just about the pride that takes place in the UK, it's about the pride that takes place around the world. And I think you alluded to it, Ben, earlier that so many people are around the world who cannot take place or pride of place, I think it was Jan, sorry, can't take pride of place where they are whether that's Istanbul, whether that's Uganda, whether that's Ghana, whether that's Sri Lanka, whether that's Malaysia, whether it's wherever in the world, they don't necessarily have the privilege or the opportunity to come together to talk about who they are, celebrate who they are. So hopefully this digital platform that we're creating will allow us to connect on the basis of, and our theme has to be about tackling loneliness and isolation. Because I think what COVID-19 and coronavirus has shown us um, is that, you know, this is really hard on 
every community that is seen as vulnerable or marginalized um, and trying to give some hope or some love or some unity means that we have to reach out in ways that we never thought we would do so before. We're collaborating with people that, you know, organizations that we wouldn't ordinarily collaborate with because it's different times. We're in very uncertain times. So you're going to see celebrations of people still in colors. You're going to hear music, which is great from UK Black Pride. You're going to hear poetry. There's going to be sessions around mindfulness and well-being. You're going to, oh, you're going to hear speeches. There's going to be stuff around, you know, tackling the politics that exist on such an intersectional level, um, framed in a way that we can't divorce ourselves from just challenging homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, intersex phobia, all forms of discrimination, but looking at some of the issues that have affected the black and brown community, such as Grenfell, Windrush, the fact that COVID-19, and I will wrap up, but I think I can't not say this, but the fact that COVID-19 for black men, they are four times more likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterpart. For Asian men, they're three times more likely. And we've already seen such a disproportionate impact of deaths of black and brown people. So and those black and brown people are in our communities, not just one community, our, our communities. So it means that reaching out at a time where people are scared, at a time when people feel so lonely and so isolated is important. And I think the thought leaders, the, the people on this, on this panel, the people listening to the webinar, this is us now, we have to connect. Whether we agree with each other's politics, there's one thing that we want to do, and this is about providing hope to LGBTQI people and looking at how we go forward for the next year and the year after that. Love that. And can I just get you to define intersectionality for those that don't understand what that is that's on the call? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, because people use intersectionality in a way that describes diversity and it's not. Intersectionality is framed in a way at which will look at the various intersections of your life. So I'm a black African lesbian of working class background. Um, so those different facets have come under major scrutiny of barriers to oppression. As a black person, I will face racism. As a woman, I will face sexism and any form of misogyny. As a working class person, you know, my socioeconomic or having had family been brought up in a working class family, um, my socioeconomic status will be very different. So my life chances and expectancy of what I can achieve or what I can reach will be different. So when we're talking about those marginalized groups that face different barriers, you have to look at things on an intersectional level. Otherwise it means that your prides are only catering for certain people. And then that causes that divide. Perfect. Thank you so much for that definition. And we are going to cover what's coming up this year as well and like the, the new plans that you guys have. Um, but Ali, for this year, how many people were you looking to be inviting to these uh, different events that Pride in London was hosting? And what would your events have looked like? Well, um, we would have expected at least probably about one and a half million people um based on what happened last year um you know we are in we're actually from from the pride movement's perspective we are living in absolutely historic times obviously last year we had the 50th anniversary of stonewall and stonewall in the uk's 30th birthday this year pride in london would have been marking um the 50th birthday of the gay liberation front who actually brought the pride movement over to uh the uk in the first in the first place um and honoring our elders um, uh, in the march um, and on our stages and it would also well, no, what it is the 20th um, anniversary of decriminalization of um, homosexuality in the uh, British military which is uh, another important thing to mark because the military has come so far in terms of 
um, acceptance of L LGBTQ people. So we had some um, big plans around that. Uh, we were planning on um, uh, continuing to grow what we would what we've been doing around our family zone. Uh, the inclusion of uh, a section in the parade, which we did last year for the first time for young people, um, and also um, expanding uh, our vision um, for our world area, which we develop in partnership with um, a London, London-based community group called Juice, uh, who are great partners. So uh, we had lots in, in, in plan. Um, some of the stuff that we had in plan from the uh, beginning of the year we are actually following through on and i know you're going to come um uh, come on to talk about that but uh yeah. we're, we're still very much excited about what we're going to be doing this year we're moving from a model where pride is about one day in the year to a year-round model um and that's a transition that we've been trying to make over the past couple of years because we know that that's what the community um wants of us so um that's you know there's there's still lots that will be coming um uh, your way from pride in london Sounds good to me. Okay, so Jan, um, we know that Stonewall doesn't have its own Pride event per se, but Stonewall does a huge amount during Pride Month and throughout the whole year. Can you just talk to us about what physical gatherings and other initiatives that Stonewall has had to rethink because of COVID-19? Well, the first thing to say is I'm very proud that, that last year we did actually formalise a partnership with UK Black Pride. Uh, Bill and I sat in a room together and shook hands uh, uh, for a, a collaboration which has grown over the last few years, but we wanted to, I mean, everyone's talking about it. There's a, there's a drumbeat to this need to be seen and support each other and, and, and raise the issues all year round. And we have been, um, I personally have been on a very uh, interesting journey, learning so much from Phil about different forms of exclusion. And I have been very keen to encourage Stonewall to get much better on the subject of, of race equity in particular, because it, it, it's terribly easy to talk about all these things, but it's so hard to own up to your own biases and, and what you don't know and what you don't understand. And we feel incredibly fortunate to have this partnership of learning uh, with UK Black Pride. So obviously it's very disappointing for us in our second year of working together that, you know, that for all the reasons that we know put, put aside and we will be working um, to support Phil in whatever way we can. Uh, we would normally attend over 30 Prides. I've already alluded to our efforts to uh, bring young people to London. Last year we particularly focused on, on bringing young people of colour to UK Black Pride. Uh, we're very keen to develop collaborations with other organisations. So last year we marched with, with a number of organisations, including, including Mermaids, including UK Black Pride, because again, we talk about intersectionality, but you need to show what it looks like to make sure that you're linking arms, properly holding hands um, in, a, in a way that, that, that is equal and respectful. In terms of what this has all meant for us, well, it's been, it's been incredibly disruptive. A huge number of our staff are actually furloughed, not because there isn't demand for their services, but because it's not possible to meet people. So, you know, all the events that we planned, we had a big fundraiser we were about to do, our annual dinner. So that's made a big hole in our revenue. Uh, like any charity, all our revenue has been hit in terms of the events where ticketed kind of events, um, paid for uh, training that we do, all of which has had to stop. And we've been madly converting every, everything into virtual uh, experiences, which is not the same, but it's better than nothing. We also were about to hold our annual workplace conference, which is pretty much a thousand people in the, in the QE2 in Westminster, people from all over the country, public, private sector, from chief executives down to graduate trainees, allies, everyone coming together to talk about best practice in the workplace, because this is where Stonewall puts a lot of effort. We, we focus on schools. We're trying to help schools be better at understanding different kinds of family and uh, sexual orientation and identity. 
There's going to be a lot of controversy around that this autumn because we've got relationship education coming into primary schools. So we can't go into schools. We can't meet with the teachers. I mean, you know, that's an incredibly disappointing thing. The workplace conference didn't take place, which is a massive area of sharing best practice. How do we make our workplaces uh, better? And of course, sport is another area. We have our Rainbow Laces campaign, which was developed uh, initially with Paddy Power, but we now have people like the, the Premier League. For those in, uh, not in the UK, what we call football, I think other countries call soccer. Uh, it's a really big deal here. And we had a, a partnership with the Premier League. Well, there's no football happening. There's no sport happening. So the normal places which provide vehicles for us to get our allies to get stuck in and show their support and for us to educate and explain what we need, they've all gone. So it's been a very difficult two months. Um, I've been very concerned about our own staff, to be honest. You know, it, it's tr we're trying to serve our communities, all of us, with our revenue disappearing down a great plug hole. And I hope we're going to come on to talk about how people can help. I don't want to be grubby, but we all need we all need money, uh, and I'm going to say that again before I go off. Uh, but, but also, you know, one's concerned about one's own people who are, you know, we, we have a very high representation of LGBTQ people within our organisation, and they, they themselves feel this is a very uh, hostile environment for them. So these are difficult times, but when you see how much we are all needed, the irony of not being able to supply when the demand has never been greater, can be quite stressful, but I don't think any of us are anything but motivated to do all that we can in spite of all the circumstances, uh, to just keep getting out there and doing everything we can. But we do need people's money. Um, you know, all, those, all that commuting that you're not doing at the moment if you're on lockdown, I would be so grateful if, if you would consider donating part of it any charity you want, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be Stonewall from my point of view. All the prides need your help. Uh, Lady Phil needs your help with Kaleidoscope, as you've just heard. There's LGBT switchboard. Local charities are absolutely dying. They're on their knees. And you may think 10 quid, 10 quid, 20 quid, $30 doesn't matter. It really does. Thank you, Jan. Yes, great plea there. And because I want to get onto the bit talking about funding, um, for the next question, we're going to talk about um, how you are adapting to this new world and what uh, your events look like this year. If we can stick to one thing, one thing that you're really excited about this year that you think is going to make impact in this new world uh, where we've gone away from in-person events, what is the one thing that your organisations are doing this year that you are really, really proud of and really excited to get done? I'm going to go to David first. One thing is so tough. Um, <laughs> we, I will say that we never had nothing as an option. And that's something that everyone um, should be very proud of. I, I am immensely inspired by our community because when we knew this was coming, everyone was ready to make a pivot and no one stomped their feet and said, we need pride, we need pride. They said, how do we reimagine pride? So that, that's first. Um, I'm gonna say one thing, but it's gonna be three. Um, Ooh, the, cheeky, the, cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> visibility, unity, and education. And we do that by creating events that provide a space for people's voices to be heard, for ideas to be shared, uh, to educate one, in, one another, uh, and to rally for causes that are important to our community. So the programming that we're putting together will provide a space, though virtually, for those things to happen and for us to move the agenda forward for the community and for our folks to be able to um, really learn about what is important. And this is a big year for all of us. It's a big, big year. So we have to really, really focus on voter registration and the census and and all the, the topics that have not left us that we still have a lot of work to do. There are trans people of color dying every day and we cannot 
forget that because we're not celebrating pride does not mean that there is not work to be done. So that's where we're going. Yes, that was a great answer. Um, why don't we go to Ali next, please? One thing that you're really excited about that Pride in London is doing this year. Okay, so for me, the one thing would be um, our strategy for this year is all centred on allyship. Um, and we're going to be um, delivering that in a number of different ways. So we have just recently launched um, something that is genuinely unique in the, the LGBTQ community, a platform called Coming Out, which you can access through our website, PrimeLondon.org. And that's about, it's like a time out really for us. Um, and it lists community events from the grassroots up, um, queer performers, talent that there is within the community, um, events that people can um, can log on to and, and take part in. Many of them are free. And that's, that's showing allyship to um, the, the performing um, uh, part of our community who are under so much pressure. I mean, the LGBT uh, venues under so much pressure because of what's happening at the moment. Um, uh, a lot of talent, obviously self-employed people who are really suffering at this time. So showing ally, allyship to um, the creative arts um, uh, LGBT communities is massive. We'll be launching a big campaign where we're encouraging people to show um, acts of allyship to each other, 30,000 minimum acts of allyship, the number of people that would have been on our parade, um, uh, are wrapped up in a campaign that's called You, Me, Us, We. Um, and I just very much echo that thought that, you know, that, that this is a time for us to pull together. This is a time for us to stand strong with each other um, and to be very alive. You know, we talk in this country about being alert. Well, we need to be very alert to the things that could slip away um, from us during this time. We've already seen that, um, uh, that the government um, seems to be, have gone very, very quiet on the um, uh, trans consultation that happened. I don't know, it feels like that was two years, it was probably two years ago now. Um, and we're very concerned about rights. So that's another thing. And another exciting thing under that allyship banner is we're going to be launching a community fund. We, we um, like everybody else, rely on, we're a volunteer organisation, we rely on funds. Um, that are um, given to us via um, sponsorship partnerships or via the community. But we're also very conscious that the community has lots and lots of needs. So we will be launching a community fund this year, um, which people uh, within London, within our LGBTQ communities can access to support uh, their needs and their projects. And we're really excited about that. So this, you know, these are, these are hard times, but they needn't be desperate times. And, and we all need to stand together to, uh, to get through them. Thank you, Ali. Jan, is there one thing from Stonewall that you're really excited about this year in lieu of there not being Pride parades to go to? I think this one thing is really hard. I am going to cheat and say two. Um, <laughs> yeah, yesterday we announced the appointment of our new chief executive, Nancy Kelly, and I couldn't agree more with Ali. We have got to get on the case politically. I know Pride is not a party and it's politics, so here we are. On her first day, her first meeting uh, will take place with the Equalities Minister. I know that we've just been through a period where all anyone wanted to think about was Brexit. We finally thought we were surfing and could start to move conversations on. And now, understandably, the government is overwhelmed with this. But I think there's some real threats to our rights. And so Stonewall will be absolutely on the case and we're developing strategies around how we're going to highlight um, any threats to the interpretation of the law as it stands now, let alone the changes that we want to see and the investment we want to see in healthcare. So that's one thing I'm excited about. And that would have happened regardless. The thing that I'm really proud of, frankly, is the amazing staff at Stonewall who have moved heaven and earth to try and find a way to convert everything that we did face to face into ways that they can be delivered virtually. So for instance, we were in the midst of giving debriefs from People's Workplace Equality Index results. All of that got converted into Microsoft Teams and Zoom meetings instead. They've worked so hard to make sure that we have stayed connected with any stakeholder who has wanted to interact with us and still wants to work on their policies, on their training, and everything they're doing to improve their workplaces, 
our team has has absolutely turned everything around to make stuff accessible and i think that's ex exceptional because people are busy anyway and i i don't you know to do that from home with all, with everything that has been going on it's remarkable what the stonewall team uh, have done to turn around our digital offering thank you jan okay so phil you've already kind of touched on some of the things that are coming up but if there was one thing just one thing phil that you're really excited about the UK Black Pride <laughs> is going to be doing this year. Ten minutes left. One thing, Phil. Okay. All right. That was Ben's way of telling me that I can't talk too long. Okay. So there isn't just one thing, but I think our connection and the work we are going to be doing this year, especially with asylum seekers, migrants and refugees. I think often in our conversation around prides, we're not talking about other marginalized groups and our asylum seekers and refugees and, asyl uh, uh, and siblings often are on little or very, very, very little money whereby they can't even top up phones to engage in things that are going to be done digitally. So maybe I'm preempting it and speaking it out and I'm not allowed to because my UK Black Pride team will tell me off, but we're looking at sessions that will allow us to pay for data for asylum seekers, refugees and migrants to attend our online virtual spaces. And importantly, we are going to be supporting, um, of course, the work Stonewall's been doing with us. We're going to continue to do that and make sure that we're connecting in so many different ways and also other grassroots organisations. But we will be supporting Kaleidoscope Trust. And I have to mention it because I know you said one thing, but Kaleidoscope Trust have will be launching on Ida Hobbit Day, which is the International Day of, against homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and intersex phobia as well. Um, we're launching a report which was conducted through TSEN, the Commonwealth Equality Network, where they have been speaking to their experiences in, a, in both a quantitative and qualitative way uh, where the data has been collected around how COVID-19 is impacting their organisations, their well-being, their mental health, the sustainability of what they can do and finding ways in which if UK Black Pride raises money through sponsors and donors, we will be signposting it to others because we're not for profit, but we're certainly about people over profit. Um, so yeah, if you've got any money, send it to us because we're going to make sure it goes out to the many different communities which are often unheard and unseen throughout our pride conversations see i was quick awesome answer there that's, that's nice and quick i like that thank you uh, okay so on to the next one you were talking about money there let's get straight into the money situation there are some really good questions on the q a as well i'm really hoping to get into a couple of those um so let's try and whiz through for money, um, this is obviously a very different year. We're not really sure what's happening in terms of actual events. People are still planning things. So what kind of conversation should people on this call be having with people in their organizations about still making sure that their pride fund is ring fenced for LGBT organizations and charities? How can they ensure that that money does not go to other, which may be necessary um, causes within the organization? Uh, who would like to answer? I think we're just gonna kind of like popcorn it around because we've only got a little bit of time left. Ali, do you wanna go first? Right, so um, this is a big one, isn't it, really? Because, you know, everybody's budgets are um, under enormous pressure and I work in the services industry and, um, you know, I, I see budgets being cut left, right and centre. But what I would say is that as, as Pride um, organisations, whether big or small, we have all had our fundraising capability, and, and Stonewall is obviously included in this, we've all had our fundraising capability absolutely wiped out. And if I speak personally about Pride in London, we rely on fundraising um, to meet, you know, probably um, uh, a good 25, 30% of our overall budget. So if you, if you haven't got that money coming in, um, uh, and then uh, the, the rest of it is made up of sort of strategic partnerships with um, uh, with brands and, and um, some money from the mayor of London as well. If you haven't got that money coming in, 
then that puts um, a great big shadow over your, um, over your financial health. Um, we do have some reserves, but we've only been around for um, six years, so they're um, pretty meagre in, in the context of, an, uh, of a, an event that costs well over a million pounds to organise every year. So we're having to be um, very, very cautious, um, very responsible in terms of what we're doing uh, around money. And, and we are going to be relying on um, certainly our strategic partners who've been fantastically supportive, but also every organisation, every, uh, every corporate that was intending to be a part of the parade. Um, that is money that um, for us is is quite crucial and you know I think that Pride in London is amongst the most privileged of prides um, because by virtue of our, our size and, and our, our profile uh, and I, I really feel and I listen to what some of the smaller prides around um, the country are saying uh, and you know I'm worried about it I'm worried about it because having seen such great growth in terms of pride events in the UK you know, we could be looking at a situation where we go quite drastically backwards next year. Um, and I would hate for that to happen because I feel that our visibility is, is absolutely crucial. I feel that, you know, that we need to continue. We have not won all the battles that we need to win. We've certainly not won the war. Um, and the, you know, the crime figures are testament to that. Um, so, you know, the, the, it is something, honestly, that keeps me awake at night. Um, but I, you know, we're fortunately, we've got a great, financial director and we are quite prudent in the way we spend spend money but it is it is absolutely vital that people remember that if they want to be a part of the pride movement then they need to support pride organizers basically but not the organizers but the organizations thank you i'm going to come to david next if that's okay um, how, is it a situation that you've seen where these corporations that maybe were sponsoring big floats and lots of merchandise, have people pulled out already? Are you seeing that? I think the conversations can be difficult, uh, but we have great partners who really do care about the mission of the organization overall that have decided to stick it out with us. If there are folks out there that are considering shifting their budgets in another direction, I would implore them not to because we have to remember that pride organizations are no longer just their marches and festivals. Pride organizations are community organizations. Um, speaking directly to New York City Pride, we have a program called the Pride Gives Back Grant Program, where we give over $150,000 a year to other LGBTQ nonprofits creating programming that maybe we can't create. So we want to help support the community in that way. And for those that may think, well, what is the benefit to me if I can't put my employees on a float and send them down Fifth Avenue? The benefit to you is that homeless LGBTQ center that we've given a portion of that grant money to that has now provided housing and stayed open during the COVID-19 crisis. That that is what we have to remember, that pride organizations are now community organizations. We are out there hand in hand trying to do the work with those out there on the front lines. Thank you. Jan, what can people say to their bosses about this? How can they make sure that their LGBT budgets are kept as they need to be kept? Yeah, so I, I try to think about this as if if I was still at Aviva, what I what would I do? I think my first move would be I'd know what the budget had been for the year and I would just cheekily go and say, can I still have it and donate? If I then found, no, sorry, we need to claw everything back, then I would be starting to make different business cases. I would remind them that the reason we had LGBTQ employee networks and the reason that we went to Pride was because it was to show the staff that we were an inclusive organization. We still had that same population within the organization. We still needed to show we were there for them. And I would explain how hostile the environment was, how precarious all the charities are. Um, and I would then try and make some kind of deal whereby how about we think about this budget in a two, in two, a two year term. So we give some cash now, we know the prides aren't happening, but let's try and do a two year sponsorship. I would try and persuade them to do match funding. So I'd say, okay, if you only give me half the money, 
what could we do as an employee network to raise the other half of the money? Would you then match it? So I think I would just try and get myself into a massive negotiation of, of every argument I could think of, like those barristers, that if the first one doesn't work, you try the next one and the next one. Um, and then I think I would, the final call would be, I would, I would try to shame uh, the bosses and I would say, look, we within, you know, our allies, because remember, it's not just the LGBTQ community anymore in workplaces. The bloody marvellous thing of the last decade is our, is our allyship. It's massive. The, the membership of Aviva Pride was, was two thirds allies uh, and, and one third LGBTQ when I was there. And I would, and I would shame them and I'd say, look, we've, had a, we've gone around our community. We've worked out that one day's commute, um, you know, if we took one day's commute costs every day of the lockdown, it amounts to X amount of money. And we've all been prepared to give that and we'd like you to match it, please. So I'd be in total put your money where your mouth has been for the last decade. Uh, and all that criticism that is given to brands for supporting pride for commercial reasons, I would be arguing you want to be one of the brands that's showing when the going gets tough, you're still there. Because if you don't do that next year, we will be shamed. And so I would be using every possible argument I could to coerce, inspire um, them to dig their hands into their pockets. And then as a community, just think about where to send it, whether it's local, um, because if it was on a bus and you're not having a bus anymore, really give some thought into what would be meaningful to your organization. If you're based in Bristol, you're based in Barbados, you know, you will, you will know what's meaningful to your staff and your customers that they would appreciate knowing you were still supporting. I think that's a great point. I've actually already had emails from various pride networks who have wanted something done about their, uh, their companies who are usually very out there with rainbows and glitter and unicorns during these times that actually have suddenly gone very quiet and their networks are being left with no money at all. So yeah, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear from other people as well actually about what is going on within their organizations and we'll talk about ways to get in contact with us after this. Phil, do you have anything to add to that? What can people say with all of that union experience that you have? What can be done to make sure that LGBT money is kept LGBT money? So look, Ben, just to put something into context for us from UK Black Pride, we have always had to struggle for money. Not, not in the sense that, you know, brands have come to us, because at one stage, remember, UK Black Pride was seen very much as this pariah. So we have had to fight constantly, tooth and nail, as a community, to source funding. So our communities are used to putting their hands in their own pocket to make sure UK Black Pride happens. When brands never wanted to touch us, you know, we were still asking, but we're very clear that, of course, we work with corporates, but ethical corporates, and we don't necessarily allow corporate organizations to center who we are as a pride, but we work with them and their networks. So I think if they're looking at where their monies or funding needs to go to, it's about, yes, supporting the prides, but asking the hard questions within their own networks of LGBT plus people what support do they need? What other organizations do they work with? You know, how can they get more involved in Black Pride? And what does, what's the human cost of supporting an asylum seeker? What's the human cost of supporting a young person which is constantly using Albert Kennedy Trust services? What's the human cost of that young disabled person that might need to use the LGBT switchboard? So there's so much that they can do, you know, we are not going to, and I always say this, and Jan's going to probably laugh, we do not stop being LGBT plus people after Pride season. We don't stop being black and brown after Black History Month. We don't stop being women. So all of these things, we need to continue and usualize the conversations. I think that these sm smaller Prides or Prides which don't get much funding, if organizations are going to divert some of their resources 
prides need to think what they're doing that's specific to COVID-19 and the vulnerable and marginalized that are impacted by it. And, you know, for some organizations, they will have to pull back their resources because just like Jan said, Stonewall has had to furlough um, workers, has had to look at how it has to be creative via virtual and digital. So can you support organizations and maybe there should be an almanac or a yellow pages of all these different organizations that are doing things to support marginalized groups but i think you know i don't want to be yeah i do want to be radical now's the time to not be unapologetic that now's the time to be apologetic about what you need you know, I will go to BNP Paribas, I will go to um, Stonewall, I will go to Aviva, and I'll say, listen, you've supported Prides for many years, but what are you doing for your own staff networks? But what are you really doing when you talk about inclusion? You know, not, let's not tokenize this, let's not tick a box, but let's put your money where your mouth is. You know, the word allyship, what does that really mean? If you're gonna be an ally or a social disruptor, get that money out there's still a lot of money out there there is still a lot of money out there and i think that we mustn't forget there are some wealthy philanthropists who can actually you know help solve lots of problems so businesses and charities don't go under but yeah it's support 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 don't be apologetic about what you do need because if you don't ask you don't know whether you can get Nicely said. Okay, so I think we have actually come over to the end of the discussion. Um, I think what would be good is just to put out a call for maybe one ask. Um, so what is your one ask that people could do, that government could do? I know we had a question that was going to be, what would you ask the person that's leading your country um, if you could ask them one thing? For me, the thing that everyone could do is get in contact with stories. Um, my summer is suddenly looking very free um, and I'm quite scared by that. So it would be good to hear from companies, from um, smaller pride networks about what this time really means to you and how you are getting through it. Um, I've got some great coverage coming up over the weekend around different experiences and over the next few weeks going to be really be delving into various different LGBT experiences. But it would be good to hear positive as well as negative. There's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of negativity, but I'd really like to hear some positive things that people are going through in these very dark times and the way to get in contact with me is ideally via email ben.hunt with an e on the end at bbc.co.uk or via social media but ideally email um jan what is your one ask and how can people get in contact well i did i did have um our friend boris in mind uh, when i thought about this question and i thought if i had if i had a lift ride with boris just me and him socially distanced of course um i would say to him I, I know how much we all celebrated your good friend, David Cameron, when he was prime minister, bringing us equal marriage. And that was a very wonderful thing because it was about love. And it was about the fact that whoever you love, you could now have that accepted and um, recognized through marriage. And what I need from you, Boris, now is I want you to go to the much more difficult place that David Cameron wasn't able to do. Maybe he wasn't really, uh, you know, didn't have your bottle, Boris. But I want you now to help us confront the hate, the other end of the spectrum. Because right now, uh, bi and trans women in particular suffer disproportionate domestic abuse. There's a domestic abuse bill uh, going through at the moment and lesbians, bisexual and trans women suffer disproportionately in many, many ways and they need investment in healthcare and services. Some of those services are provided by charities and these charities are on their knees. We need a sustainable model, please Boris, to help the vulnerable in our communities, the people who suffer hate every day for trying to be who they are, and who suffer the distress of not being able to get access to the health care and the services that they deserve to be delivered to them in a respectful way. And you'll really annoy David Cameron if you do all that. <laughs> and how can people get in contact with you if they need to? 
Well, I'm, I'm available on uh, LinkedIn and stonewall.org.uk is our website. Um, I'd be very pleased to hear from anyone directly. And I know that, the, that, that Stonewall are manning the, the, the phones and the email all the time. So do just get straight, straight in touch with us. Okay, um, Phil, I'm going to come to you next, if that's okay. What is your one ask of the people watching or the government and how can people get in contact? Okay, so I think my ask of the government is to really think about how they look at policies, how they impact all people who are marginalised. I think it's really easy for me just to talk about, you know, people of colour, but we mentioned at the beginning, you know, if we're not looking at things through an intersectional frame or a lens, then it makes everything else so redundant. So, you know, if it's Boris, um, you know, I would like to ask him, I hope that he thanks our wonderful NHS, which is made up of predominantly black and brown people um, who have supported him. And he might be able to take back some of those words which were not so pleasant. Um, but really, it's policies, procedures and not rolling back the hands of time on on you know issues around trans people, around poverty, around so many different things um, and especially right now whilst we're in this pandemic the issue of human rights is always something which will be impacted the most so I'd like to know that our governments doing enough to divert efforts to those who are already used to socially distancing but are having to physically distance and how do we ensure that not just through humanitarian aid, but how do we make sure that LGBT rights here and abroad are honored and upheld and people are protected and that no one is left behind. But to the people listening, to anyone on the line, I would say sometimes we really have to come out of our comfort zone. Sometimes we have to challenge our own selves and understand that you know, even our biases and our prejudice, now is not the time for it. We need hope, we need to inspire, we need solidarity, and more importantly, we need unity at a time where we are scared. Thank you. And did you say how to contact you in there? You can contact ukblackpride.org.uk, all lowercase. You can contact Kaleidoscope Trust, all one word, dot com. Um, and you can contact me via Lady Phil, Twitter, social media platforms. Awesome stuff. David, what would you, what would you ask Trump? <laughs> one question or one ask from Trump. I'd ask for respect to come back into the general conversation. I think we're lacking a lot of respect. And something that I've learned in the last few months as we've been going through this crisis is how important, as Phil said, um, unity is. And I haven't talked to so many pride organizers and organizations in the four years I've been with New York City Pride as much as I have in these last two months. So let's continue to move that forward. Let's continue to have these conversations. Our community has oftentimes been at the forefront of change and we thrive when united. So let's continue to stay united and figure out ways to get be innovative and, and express our pride, not just for all of those who may have the opportunity to express it openly, but really specifically for those people who may be in less than ideal situations who now don't have that escape, who can't, like I did when I was, 18 years old, run off to my first pride and, and experience it. Now that's not available to them. So we have to continue to have conversations and brainstorm and, and innovate and figure out how we can get to those people. Thank you. And how best to contact you, David? Uh, you can find me at nycpride.org. All my contact information is there. You can also find us on Instagram, NYC Pride. Perfect, thank you. And Ali, what would you ask um, our Prime Minister and what's the best way to get in contact with you? So the best way to get in contact with me is through um, pridelandlondon.org um, and our email uh, contacts are on there. And I'm at Ali Camps on uh, Twitter. I mean, I, 
I can't really uh, say much more than Jan and, and Phil have said in terms of the issues. And I watched um, our Equalities Minister answer a question that a Scottish MP asked her on the floor of the House, House of the Commons um, uh, last week, I think it was, um, which was highlighting the fact that LGBTQ communities are under, um, in, in many instances, increased, uh, increased pressure um, and increased hardship um, uh, as a result of um, the, the pandemic. And the, the Scottish MP was asking the Equalities Minister, um, what was the government going to do about it? And I'm delighted to hear, Jan, that her first meeting, uh, your new Chief Exec's meeting, first meeting is with the Equalities Minister. And I was just so struck. She answered the question by taking a piece of paper that she had to read. So she obviously, you know, it wasn't something that was, was kind of innate that she, she was feeling. It was something she had to read. Um, and she responded by saying that she'd extended the contract of somebody who was working in, I don't know, a work a task force or whatever. I'm not quite sure what it was, but she couldn't have looked more um, uninterested if she if she had tried. And it frightened me because I feel that we are um, that there is an attitude that says, well, we're OK. You know, we, I often hear British politicians talk about how Britain leads the way um, in the world as far as um, LGBT plus issues are concerned, well, that's great, isn't it? But it doesn't really take account of the damage that we did um, uh, in, in the days of the jolly old empire. Um, and um, it's also naive in the extreme when you look at hate crime figures. So um, I just want to endorse what other people have said. And my one thing, actually, my one ask is of the people on this call and to say, actually, there are ways that we can support our communities who are in hardship right now. Um, and I would encourage everybody uh, never mind looking at my Twitter, please go to um, Coming Out and look at all of those grassroots events that community groups and, and the creative uh, industries and, uh, and performing arts communities are putting on through Coming Out um, that Pride in London is uh, promoting and get involved and support them because by doing that you can make um, a genuine uh, difference to somebody's, uh, to somebody's livelihood and well-being. So please do that. Perfect. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, that actually brings us to a close. We're only 17 minutes over time, so we've done well. Um, I'm going to pass over to Pippa, um, one of the founders now. And I think if we can just all just leave the contact details in the uh, chat, anyone can obviously get in contact if they need to. But over to Pippa. Um, I hope, can everybody hear me? I hope so. Um, I have to say, as um, a, a, a participant, just to listen to you, it, your voices have completely blown me away. I can't thank you as a panel enough. Yes, it's hostile out there, but yes, you are def definitely inspiring us to keep up hope, keep up efforts. Um, I think if we haven't demonstrated in the past um, hour and a bit that um, our pride marches, our pride protests, our pride love and unity really really matters 220 is going to be tough um we need everybody to stay with us we need everyone to stay safe um lbtq women have a strap line which is if you think your home is with us your home is with us um i believe that strongly for the wider lgbt lgbt community let's um anyway i just also really want to thank for fora for hosting us thank you ben for doing a great job um, and for every single one of you who's dialed in today, please share these messages. It's important. We see you. You matter. Keep safe. Thank you.